Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Christina Southam with the BYU Management Society, and we are so thrilled to have you here today. We're excited to hear from Aaron Franklin, and I'm going to introduce him in a moment. Um, for those of you who are new, the Manage BYU Management Society is an international organization. We have about 100 chapters around the world, and about half of those are domestic and half in the USA, and half of those are, are abroad. And so we invite you to check out byums.byu.edu to find a chapter near you. We also have a global chapter if there is not one near you, and so you can join that too. Um, our mission is to grow moral and ethical leadership around the world. And so we are always looking for uh, opportunities to discuss how we can increase our moral and ethical leadership. And thank you for being a part of that mission. I'd like to go ahead and introduce Aaron Franklin. And he is the Addy Professor of Electoral, er, Electrical and Computer Engineering and Chemistry at Duke University, where he leads a group of graduate and undergraduate students exploring new electronics, biosensors for nanomaterials, and Aaron serves as the Director of Graduate Studies, training PhD students on responsible ethical research, conduct, and directs 400 plus student graduate program. Aaron, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Christina. What an honor to be here. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen before I launch into uh, the beginning of the talk here. Uh, I have had the pleasure of speaking at a local chapter of BYUMS, and it was a thrill to step out of my typical technology sector and, and engage with folks that had different and refreshing viewpoints on even on some of the technical aspects of, of the work I do. So it's really an honor. I'm, I'm impressed by the work that this organization does. And uh, I'm further thrilled to actually shine a little bit of an extra light onto the aspects of ethics in the scientific side of what underpins what ends up turning out to be product and uh, things in the marketplace. So thank you to everyone for their willingness to cut out part of their Friday, maybe morning, maybe evening, depending on where you are. And uh, I'll go ahead and launch right in here. So the one thing that I really love about uh, the BYU MS is this guiding mission of growing moral and ethical leadership around the world. And so when I see this and when I was invited to give this webinar, it occurred to me that my mindset was, was pretty thoroughly couched in the scientific side of the world, probably a part that is not considered uh, quite as specifically in other webinars or engagements that are had in this organization. So some of what I'll share, I think will be a little uh, new to the folks that are part of the society. For those who are guests and uh, are just willing or crazy enough to listen to me blab for 30 or 40 minutes, uh, bless you. And uh, I hope still to offer something that might also be a little bit new. One thing I wanted to note is I was invited uh, to read this business ethics field guide recently, which has authors that I think are uh, involved in this organization. And I got to tell you, I don't read very many business books. Okay. So most of what you see on the shelf behind me would bore you to tears. And maybe you could say that about some business books, but for me, this book was, it was fascinating. And, and I found not just some life lesson insights, but lessons that translated into my own sphere of work, even though it has much less to do with the business world. So I highly recommend it if, if it's a book that you have not read. And I'll even try to make some connections to some of the principles that were highlighted in that book with uh, the stories that I'll share with you today. So I want to start with a, with a video uh, that highlights uh, a bit of the ethical challenge for a scientist. And this is, it, the quality is terrible. So I warn you in advance, if, if you can't quite hear the audio, I apologize. Let me give you a small bit of background though. So when I was at IBM Research, working with a team of researchers on carbon nanotube transistors, you don't have to know what that means or what that is. It's just something that's supposed to do something amazing someday. And we were doing a lot of work on it. We thought we were making good progress, but it was a struggle to get the management to stay motivated to keep funding our research. And so we would feed them appropriate and accurate information in a way that hopefully promoted their willingness to support us. And after having fed such information one time, I got a phone call early in the morning when I showed up to the office that said, 
John Kelly, who's the individual that you can see in this CNBC clip on the screen, who is the director of IBM Research at the time, he's giving an interview on CNBC this afternoon, and he needs you to get him a chip that shows your devices so that he can demonstrate it for the folks at CNBC. Well, that's a moment most scientists don't really get, okay? So a scientist doesn't want their face on the screen. They want what they have made to be on the screen. And so in a lot of ways, the clip you're about to see was a monumental part of my career. So let me let you watch it. And then I'll tell you my reaction after the clip actually occurred uh, when I saw it myself, okay? Well, we have actually built, this is not science fiction. Uh, we have built prototypes and circuits of all types of devices with all different materials. In fact, I stopped by the lab. I anticipated you might ask me that. And I grabbed a chip which we have built out of, uh, it's built on silicon, but it's built with carbon. It has very high speed carbon switching devices at very, very low power. So when this chip is shrunk, we could put this in a very high speed communication device. We could put it in your cell phone, your web access device. And, you know, simply put, you'd have much higher performance and your batteries would last for weeks, not a few hours. Really? Okay. You might have noticed on the side of the screen, I kept a very tracker for how many times the superlative was applied to the description that our fearless leader was providing to the world of what it is we were doing. The other thing that you may have noticed is the reaction of the uh, interviewer, which was really. Now, that reaction can be tuned depending upon who says it because the, the same word was used by myself and my colleagues when we watched the clip, but for entirely different reasons. Because the response from the interviewer was a really born out of excitement, the anticipation. You guys are working on a technology that's gonna give me weeks of battery life. That's the only thing that that gentleman took away from that conversation. None of the other jargon really made a big difference. Four varies and one really gave him everything that he needed to know about what was being said. Meanwhile, on the other end, were myself, was myself and my colleagues thinking, what have we done? Not, not because we're not thrilled that we got you know, 30, 40 seconds of, uh, of screen time with our chip in the hands of uh, John Kelly, but because we realized that all the messaging that we'd so carefully packaged led to a conclusion that didn't quite feel exactly right. And I didn't really know what to do about that. I certainly couldn't contact the guy at CNBC and let him know that, you know, we may want to soften some of the conclusive uh, results that were shared in the interview. So that's, that's a, I don't want to say it's the start of ethical conundrums that I have had to churn on in my scientific career, but it's, it's a great example of the few that I'll share with you as we talk today. So on the next few slides, I, I wanna sort of set a little bit more background of this, of this conversation with some things that you probably are aware of that our technologies brought to market. And I wanna point, point them out just to make sure that we know there are a lot of paths to this particular seed. That there are ways that things come to the market that are very open and obvious. One of those is organic light emitting diodes. OLED displays back in 2003. I remember seeing this display as an undergraduate at Arizona State University and thinking, the future is here. Look at this thing. It can roll, it can flex. It's made of this organic material on plastic. I was absolutely amazed and thought this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow this and see what happens. A few years later, you've got these gentlemen that and are- this is something that looks like it's straight out of the future. Mm -hmm. Look at how razor thin this Sony XEL1 11 inch organic LED flat panel TV looks. It's amazing. In fact, any television can change channels. This one completely changes television. Wow, that's, a, that's an awfully big claim. Changing television in 2007 with an 11 inch screen that cost $2,500. Needless to say, it did not change television yet, but the fact that the technology had come that far, even in a few years, was enough to keep investment into research that eventually led to a video like this that you can find today. And if you have not uh, had the chance to learn about OLED wallpaper, which is what this video is showing you, 
it's it's i think even to the least tech interested person it's quite fascinating it's as thin as the picture you see on the screen over here in the right where if i turn my laser pointer on it's bigger than the size of that screen thickness that you see over on the side okay here's another one the segue totally opposite end of the spectrum for those who may not remember the Segway and its entrance into our world right at the turn of the century in the year 2000, it was landmark. In fact, what made it landmark isn't even the technology, it's all the buzz they created about it before we even knew what it was. And so everyone was told, Dean Kamen has changed your world. This is going to be bigger than the internet, bigger than the personal computer. And in fact, this is one of my favorite, this is a real quote, okay? This quote comes from an article at the time. My best guess, someone says, after looking over the patents Dean Kamen now holds after reading about the inventor, is that Ginger, that was the code name for the Segway, is a transportation device that flies and requires no gasoline. That's how high the hype swing had got when it came to considering the Segway's interest in the market. It's absolutely, I mean, it's funny to us now, but at the time, there were folks who really felt like this is how big it was going to be. Well, if you haven't ridden a Segway, you better do it quickly because now we're 20 years later and their era is coming to an end. Whether or not people will keep making them in spin-off versions, who knows? I know that my kids ride around on ones that don't have handles that I've almost killed myself on. And that seems to be allowing the technology to live on. But a lot of what was hyped and the vision that was painted never really came to reality. Here's another one, transistors and Moore's law. This is much closer to home for me because my core research work is actually in the underpinnings of what enables Moore's law today or what tries to keep it alive at least. Moore's law is about basically improving the capabilities of any computation device that you interact with. In fact, from personal computers and what they've become to innovations in medicine and transportation, Moore's law has made every piece of that possible by improving what we can do at the actual core technology processing interface. But we are entering an era where most people don't realize Moore's law is either dead already or very near its end. And that's no longer just some type of a provocative way of getting people to think about the importance of this field. It is a reality that is acknowledged and even integrated into the, uh, the path forward for major semiconductor companies in a half a trillion dollar industry. Tons of implications with respect to what happens next in that field. One more uh, on the technology front is one that I love. Because when I saw an article in the early 2000s on a hydrogen fuel cell car, I was like, we're in a different world now. I mean, forget D Dean Kamen's invention. It didn't do it. It didn't fly. It didn't run on no gasoline. But this thing spits water out of the muffler. There could be nothing better. Okay? It, I, I could not get, get off of the excitement of, of what the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle was supposed to be. And there were other people with me. And that's why California passed a, a certain prop that put money into building up to 100 stations by 2020. Unfortunately, there are only 40 of those stations. And there are very few hydrogen fuel cell vehicles yet. Why? Well, at least in part, is because their greatest competitor, the electric vehicle, absolutely steamrolled them. And part of that has to do with the involvement that many of the folks in the manufacturing sector took on with making electric vehicle options and with deploying charging stations. This is the LA area alone. And you can see over 250 charging stations available within that footprint. All right, now take all of those inventions, all of those things you've seen come to market. And let's look at one that probably matters more than any of the other ones do. And it's likely that every person here has had an impact in their life because of this one. And that is cancer in any of its forms or varieties. I was struck a number of years ago by how frequently I realized I had seen headline articles about the cure for cancer. And not just a cure for a cancer or at a certain stage of cancer, but for an actual complete remedy to this ailment. 
And this is just one of many examples. And this one's from just over a year ago that talks about there being within a year, uh, the ability to completely cure cancer. And if you were to think about this in, in sort of a reaction sense, okay? So this is my chemist brain working uh, and I'm only a chemist part of my brain, but I feel like I'm 90% now because my daughter's taking AP chemistry in high school. And all of a sudden all my textbooks are back out and all the old chemistry things are coming back to fruition. So everything's a reaction now. So if you think about this reaction, superlatives plus science yields what? What happens if I mix these two things in my beaker? And at least one thing for sure happens, lots of confusion. And that can be manifest in just in this medical cancer sector, or, or not just cancer, any medical sector, by the headline articles you see coming onto the screen. It doesn't matter the malady that you choose. There is some type of exaggerated superlative language that is infecting the way that we interpret the status of treatment. And so something about what's happening in the real science versus what reaches us as the public is getting completely skewed along the way. And just to give you a more quantitative feel for how intense this problem is, this, this, these plots, this is one of those pictures worth the thousand words cliche, this is it. When I was putting these slides together and I was like, oh, I wanna tell some stories, oh, I wanna tell them some things. And then I found this paper and I was like, okay, if I just put this plot up, it's, it is worth anything else I say. And this is the reason why. If you look at this top left corner up here, it's showing you the percentage of change in the use of this type of superlative language, these positive adjectives latched onto description of some scientific finding. Look at the amount of change in just the last 40 or 50 years. It, I mean, it should blow your mind, this change, okay? And, and that's coming from a scientist who is part of the problem because I have been absorbed into this world where I've recognized the power and importance of selling what is discovered, of selling what is found. And I mean, look at this, this quote from this article. The use of their top words out of the 25 they track, robust, novel, innovative, and unprecedented are those four words. And by the way, my grad students, some of them are on the line. They know we laugh at journal titles that sometimes use all four of words like this in the title of a paper, in the title. We'll have all four of these. And, and it says the relative frequency of use is up 15,000% in that time. Again, I mean, I know my, my kind of, you know, excited tone probably does enough justice to help you really, but, but that's, that's mind blowing. And that, that trend is not trailing off based upon what you see in this data. So something, is, something has become fundamentally flawed in the way that we communicate what we have found and the scientific work. And we have to figure out what has happened that has led us to get to this place. Okay, oh, and I had a little animation there. So I, put, I added to the reaction. So one of the reasons why you see this happen is because the other product of that reaction is often more funding and more promotion capabilities. And that's a problem, right? But, but, but it is, regardless of it being a, an ethical problem, it is still a product of the reaction, okay? So the ethical problem is that we're allowing it, but, uh, but it still is a product. This is another way of kind of talking about some of the same thing. You may have seen versions of this in, in the business world. It, it's called different things. In this case, they call it the hype pendulum. It's what you go through when you're trying to push something from an idea to, to the market. But honestly, if you just ignore the market side and think about my career as a scientist, over 20 years, I've ridden this thing like a roller coaster. And it's not because I've made it all the way to the plateau of productivity over and over again. It's because I kind of go up and down this same area here through the trough of disillusionment over and over again. And the reasons behind why that happens or what I want to dissect more carefully. So a um, couple caveats, and, and this is kind of midway through my talk, so it's kind of weird to put it here, but I, I still want to point it out. Caveat is I'm focusing primarily on these unseen or unconsidered ethical decisions in scientific research or results. What I'm not focused on are some of the more well-known blatant ones. Here's, to me, the hallmark of all examples. 
you probably or maybe have heard of Theranos. Theranos, in case you haven't heard of where nearly, nearly a billion dollars of uh, really honest investor money went, it's into a company that had promised, way over promised, the ability to transform diagnostic medicine with a finger prick of blood. Now, this one's especially close to home for me because research in my lab does work that's very much like what Theranos claimed to do. And so a lot of what we're trying to actually succeed at were things that they were making claims to have done a few years ago. But here's what should astonish you about Theranos. In case you, in case you, don't, you know, haven't really tracked it or learned much about it, there's a lot of pop culture stuff about it. But the, the reality is it is highly unlikely that Theranos was started on false principles. It was likely started on very true principles of sound scientific finding of capabilities that were motivating and that got some seed investment into the idea. It's what happened as the money kept coming and the pressure kept mounting that I think really makes this story stand out. And I don't, I don't know the inner work because honestly, I don't know if anyone does. That's why it's going to court right now to figure out. But the reality is we had a company absorb nearly a billion dollars in investor money, go up to 10 billion in peak valuation and lasted for 12 years before anyone realized that something was terribly wrong. So that's something that we have to kind of evaluate about what we might be feeding through the process of how we treat scientific discoveries today. All right, so the process. So before I share a few stories, uh, I, I wanna make sure that this, this vision from initial scientific discovery through something hitting the market, what it looks like. So in a little stick figure graphics here, you have basic scientific research. This is the amazing stuff that the graduate students in my lab do. It's incredible work that I get the pleasure of being able to talk to people about. It doesn't really look like this picture though. I think this one is a little bit more appropriate because most of the time things don't work. Hopefully they don't explode, but this one captures it I think a bit better. Then you have a breakthrough. It does happen eventually. Okay, and that breakthrough is celebrated, it's important, and it lets us keep moving forward. And if it's a breakthrough worth trying to push to market, then there's gonna be a lot of attempt to verify that breakthrough, a lot of reproducibility work. This would be where like FDA clearances would lie in a lot of ways, or clinical trials even before that when it comes to medicine. That eventually may translate to an actual product. If it verifies, if it looks like it's reproducible, and in, if it gets to a productization, it could even make it to market. And don't ask me why there's a bunch of different forms of food in that stick figure graphic. I couldn't find a better one, I apologize. But it could be anything, food or otherwise, that can reach the market after an initial scientific uh, breakthrough, okay? Here's what ends up happening most of the time though. 99.99%, that is not a statistically significant quantitative number. I just made it up. I could have put most of the time, but it is almost all of the time you go back through this loop. You go through the loop where you had a breakthrough, but you realize there's just so much more to do. It's not quite the level of rigor that's needed for ramping it through the next phase. And in order to stay in that loop, it takes a lot of money, like a ton of money, in order to keep the academic research engine going, the corporate research engines going. All of that process needs constant fuel in order to keep it running. And then there comes those points when the media gets to learn something about what's happening in this whole process. And if I were to put a qualitative uh, representation of when that report comes out, it would look something like this, where the size of the arrow represents when it usually happens. You hear, you hear very little about what they're actually trying to do in the experiments, and you even hear little about whether it ends up reproducing or being validated. You hear a lot about what the individual breakthroughs might be along the way. Okay. And I don't know as much about the whole business side when you get to the product phase. And I just know there's a lot of marketing that happens once people need to start buying whatever it is that's produced. But we'll talk less about the purple side to this. We're really focused more on these orange lines. Okay. So I want to answer a few questions from that chart. Uh, the, a few questions about ethical challenges and processes along the way. The first is with another analogy. I've used this analogy in a lot of ways in the last 10 years of my career. So, and it usually is around getting funding for scientific research. So say I'm a scientist and I want to study something. So I'm an academic, uh, in an academic lab and I have the resources to do it, but I need the money to make it happen. 
So I am like the parents in a car trip. Hopefully you've taken a road trip before and imagine road trips, you get so, there's so much excitement, right? And you sell it to the passengers, which are the kids, by this is this amazing place we are going. You are going to love it. It's like paradise, okay? And the kids get excited. And the kids are the funding agencies. These are the guys that have the money. These are the ones who need you to write long proposals that get funded less than 10% of the time and that you need to wow them with and that you need to show output and productivity and return and all of this has to happen, okay? That's the kids. They're in the back of the car. They were excited when they decided to take this trip with you. They were motivated even by the trip. But then you started going. And how long does it take before something else more exciting seems to come along the way? And I call this the are, the are we there yet effect. This is the we'll never get there. It's taking forever. And, and oh, look, the next new thing is right there on the side of the road. Everyone is going to the next new thing. Surely paradise is too far off and we've spent too long already. Let's get out and check out the next new thing. Only to find out that's what everyone did. Everyone stopped doing what they had been on the road to achieve towards this destination that may have been very properly motivated in order to spend time on the next new thing because that's the piece of the puzzle that drives where the money gets pushed when it comes to our scientific research. And so you're left with a few believers who decided and the next new thing's not where it's at. I've got to keep on the path. And whether they actually will ever get there is the big unknown because without the right resources, the likelihood is actually very small. Here's a couple perspectives uh, on this side of, uh, of where the money goes and ultimately who does the work and gets credit for it. So on this, the who gets credit side of things, uh, a story that I really love from the history in my field is captured in this picture here. So if we were in an interactive state, like I am with my uh, lectures, then I would have you try to guess who these three gentlemen are, if any of them, uh, who are the inventors of the transistor. And uh, we won't do that because on Zoom, it's hard to be a little more interactive that way. But uh, most people would come up with one of their names, if any, and the name would be William Shockley. And that's because William Shockley was a very formidable character. He's the kind of person that once you know, you don't stop knowing who he was. And he managed a group at Bell Labs in the 1940s. And he was one of the pioneers of semiconductor physics, a new material system still dubious to a lot of other researchers. Well, he had an idea broadly of making this kind of device, but no real idea of how to do it. So he handed it off to John Bardeen, who was a theorist, and Walter Bratton, who was a tinkerer, experimentalist. And they spent time, over years of time, actually making this thing happen. No involvement from William Shockley, no awareness from William Shockley until the patent application landed on his desk as their manager. And there's a lot of versions to this part of the story, but the only version we know is true is that William Shockley's name ended up on the patent application that, and it had not been there before it, it landed on his desk. And some of that was that, hey, I, I told them to work on this and lots of lots of controversy around who got credit with that whole thing. Well. Needless to say, the personality that William Shockley had is not very friendly to the people you work with. So Walter Bratton, John Bardeen, they were well gone from Bell Labs when the Nobel Prize was given in 1956 for the invention of the transistor. So they got back together for a photo op, which I love this picture, because if you know anything about these, these people's personalities, you've got William Shockley, who's the most known, and so of course the photographer puts him at the microscope handling Walter Bratton's baby. While Walter Bratton, who is a fairly short-tempered gentleman, is staring on with as if looks could kill to William Shockley. And old pacifist John Bardeen is looking at Walter saying, it's okay, it's gonna be okay. And uh, William Shockley's reputation carried with him after this story, by the way. He went on to this small, lesser known town, uh, some tens of miles outside of San Francisco called Palo Alto. He went there because there was this university called Stanford and he had family nearby, he wanted to be near his mom. And he started a company called Shockley Semiconductor. He hired people, they hated him almost instantly. And a few years later, they left. He called them the traitorous eight. In that eight were Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce who went on to start Intel. Intel became the birth of what we now look at as Silicon Valley. 
and the hub of all of the growing sector that came to bear uh, after the hardware into the software sector that's there. So, hey, William Shockley gets some credit. I, I think it's worth remembering who he is, just maybe not a whole lot of the interactions. Another cool thing about this story, even when appropriate credit may not have been given in an ethical manner, nice guys do sometimes finish first. John Bardeen is one of the most uh, incredible scientists, I think, of, of our, our entire past century. And he went to the University of Illinois and ended up becoming the only person to this day who won two Nobel Prizes in the same field, which was physics in this case. Pretty remarkable. And uh, his biography is a great read if you're ever interested. Now, my own experiences on this front have mostly been with respect to authorship on journal papers. I don't have a Nobel Prize to speak of. I don't necessarily plan on getting one. And if I did, I certainly would hope that it wouldn't carry the controversy that the transistor or others have carried. But when it comes to authoring a paper, which is where any prize is going to start for a scientist, the controversies are many. And at least two uh, that I have seen, I'll share very briefly. First, you should know something. When you author a journal paper as a scientist, where your name shows up matters a lot. Now, there are two positions that matter most. The first position, that arguably is the most important because everyone looks at the first author and says that he or she is the one that did the work. They're the ones that know everything that happened in this study and that wrote the paper, okay? The second most important position is the last author. The last author is the one who guided the work they shepherded it along. It was their brainchild to at least build a lab or some infrastructure and guide this thing to actual success. Every other position on that list is marginal in meaningfulness. Whether you're second, third, or 20th on that list is mildly consequential, okay? So I wanted to frame it that way because when I went through one of my experiences, it had everything to do with position on an author list. It was earlier in my career when a paper was put together that had been the uh, involvement of the work had been between myself and a colleague of mine who he had led the work and I had been involved as sort of a secondhand person. And when we ended up putting it all together, he was the lead author and the lead author decides the order of the authors. He added onto the author list a more senior researcher, not our manager or boss, but a more senior researcher who did one experiment with this process, okay? After all the work that was done, all the preparing of the manuscript, one experiment. When the lead author sent the paper to this individual for his feedback when it was being written, this is, I wish I were making this up, but the person wrote back and they said, I only, great work, I only have one edit. Please change this and it's ready to be published. And, and so my colleague opened the paper and the only thing he had changed is the position of his name in the author list. He'd moved it from the third position where he had been to the second position, supplanting me as the second position author. Now I was pretty new in my scientific career and these things mattered a whole lot more than they should have. As I re-examined the ethical nature of this situation, I had to reconsider some of the charged emotions that I ended up having at the time because I felt it was unfair. I felt it was certainly it was inaccurate at the very least. So I decided I was not going to yield. And so the, the situation escalated and eventually it reached those who were managing the research. I was called in to one such manager's office who is a great person by the way. And I was asked in a beat around the bush manner uh, if I were willing to take what we, he was termed as essentially the higher road. In fact, the way that it was specifically said to me was, you know, this whole thing would just be resolved if you happen to be willing to be the third author on this paper. And, you know, he wasn't wrong. And I did follow his advice. And as I read that, that field guide to business ethics, I could hear all of that situation come back in my mind. And I wondered if the culture of that situation or of the relationship that had been established were worth the yielding in ethical balance that I gave in order to allow it to go forward. The consequence of that paper is minor. No Nobel Prize is going to be given over that paper. But the meaningfulness of considering who gets credit is a really important one that, that still comes out of it. 
The other story very briefly is when I was at another uh, capacity, another role in my career, there was a situation where I had worked very hard in order to get the chance to write what's called a review paper. That's an important thing in the scientific world. When you write a review paper, it tends to get cited 10 times more than any normal paper would. And so you want citations, you want people to know who you are, it's a great opportunity. So I did everything I could to make that possible for my research team at the time. And uh, I got an invitation for us and I got everyone involved, okay, let's do this and we start putting some things together. And I get called in to my manager's office and I got asked if based upon the challenges that a colleague was having with their own career path and publications, if I wouldn't be willing to allow them to take the lead role of authoring this paper instead of me. Now, I was not told that that was how it's going to be. I was told, it was not something that anyone else was aware of. And it's not something I would ever share with an individual. And I've had plenty of review authorship papers to where there's no telling which one I'm actually talking about. But I'll tell you, I did decide to do that. I think it was the right thing culturally in our organization. I don't think I compromised ethics in doing so, but I did compromise some of the credit that goes to one direction versus another in the actual development of that opportunity. Okay, enough about that. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Just because some guy's bent out of shape because he didn't get to be on the author list where he wanted to be. What does it mean? It means way more than it maybe should because where you are on that list will drive your reputation. Your reputation will drive where you get invited to give talks and interviews. That will lead to more and hopefully even better reputation. That will lead you to get more funding because people won't want to put money in the pockets of someone who's known, noticed, and publishes a lot. And that will lead to more students to come to you, good students with external money that already supports them. That will give you even better reputation because they will come and they will do good work that you have very little to do with. And this cycle will just continue to snowball into the preeminent scientists that lead the field today. Now, I don't say that because I think negatively about those scientists. It is the system that has created the snowball effect that we have ended up having in our system, in, in, the, in the layout. But is it right? That's something that I, I don't quite know. Here's one thing that gives me pause. The Nobel Prize in 2010 was given to Andre Game and Kostov Novoselov. These researchers at University of Manchester isolated a material called graphene, the thinnest known material to all, of all time. It's a single atom thick and yet still structurally intact. I can talk a lot about graphene to you. I won't bore you through that today, but I will tell you when that Nobel Prize was issued in 2010, it was the most controversial in some people's opinion in the history of the Nobel Prize in physics. And that's saying something. If you look at some of the commentary that came out just months after it was announced, it is scathing. The Nobel Committee was seen as overlooking critical researchers who contributed at least as much, if not more in some estimations, than these two researchers did. The Nobel Prize could have been shared by more than two. And in fact, one of these individuals by the name of Philip Kim, who I have the pleasure of knowing through some interactions when he was a professor at Columbia, he's now at Harvard, he gave one of the best examples of high character I've seen in my whole career, knowing that he was absolutely a contender that could have been considered and being told that by about every front that he had in, uh, available to him, his response, and I've heard him give it in person many times, is I am honored to be considered to maybe be on that list, but I respect the decision. I don't know where the ethics in all of this are, but I'll tell you the type of moral character and of, of just willingness to recognize uh, that ultimately we rely on an imperfect system to make decisions has always stuck with me. And I think it's something that we could take away regardless of how we see success or recognition acknowledged in our fields. Now, what about the ramifications though? There are ramifications and boy, they are big ramifications. When the Nobel Prize gets issued, it creates a clamor of activity around whatever it is that it was issued for. When the Nobel Prize was given in this case, the, 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 the actual discovery, it only happened a handful of years beforehand. That is rather unprecedented. And it meant that should be capitalized on. 
So the European Union, since these researchers came from the EU's funding district, decided to change the world's history by putting more money into one single pot than has ever been done in scientific research. One billion dollars were given solely for the research and exploration of this single material. In a world of millions of materials, a billion euros pushed into one. I say that with an intended air of skepticism and uncertainty about whether that was a good move. Even the people who made the decision ended up having some misgivings by saying, did we say graphene flagship? We, we meant anything that is two dimensional in nature like graphene. So they have done some course correction of this flagship that was set sail with the biggest pot of money in scientific research history. But the end result is the same. We gave a Nobel Prize to give credit to two people and that resulted in the largest sum of money into one research direction in history. So the ramifications of who gets credit cannot be questioned when it comes to the impact on the, the world that we live in and what we study. All right, a couple of more slides and I'll get wrapped up so because I'd love to be able to take questions here. So what gets reported is another piece of this. My lab does research on printed electronics. That probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you other than it might sound a little bit cool. It is very cool. And in fact, the students who do the work in the lab are the ones that make it cool. This is a, an image of some transistors being printed on paper in our lab. They function electronically in a way very similar to how they function in the billions on a computer chip. And we develop the inks, we print these devices for different applications. And sometimes my grad students get really crazy ideas that they ask forgiveness rather than permission for. And this is one of those examples where one of my students printed these conductive lines onto his finger in order to demonstrate that we can print conductive materials at low temperatures, room temperature in this case, which was a serious technological feat. That little printing of those lines allowed the student to power a light emitting diode. And you can see him bend the finger and the light stays lit and tons of ooh and ah, whether from those who are in the scientific world or outside of it. Now, what we said to the scientific world about this was that we developed a new ink that allowed for printing conductive features at room temperature. And that was pretty darn thrilling as it was to us that we were capable of doing that. What they heard, however, was a little bit different. Take, for instance, the one of many news articles that came out about the work that talked about electronic tattoos and bandages that biosensors that could become a reality. Now, I don't fault this one too much. When we were pressed to tell them why we cared about what we did, we yielded to the fact that our dream vision here was that we could use printed materials to make things like smart bandages a reality. So we planted that seed and we have to own the ethical behavior behind it being reported widely in publications like this. But it got weirder. We posted a video from Duke that showed this technology and it's been viewed tens of thousands of times and comments started showing up like this, which pulled biblical prophecies and warnings into the air about the mark of the beast being related to this research where my student decided to stick his finger under a printer that was spitting out conductive lines. So that was a surprise, but not even as much of a surprise as the phone call I got a month after we published the work from a talk show based out of the UK called The Unexplained. Now, this is a relatively popular thing. They have a TV part to the series. I'd never heard of it beforehand. And so I thought, hey, that sounds cool. They want to talk to me about our printed room temperature conductive features. Oh, my gosh. I love that they're excited about it. I didn't learn until leading into the interview that the primary focus of this series is on paranormal activity and conspiracies. So I was being uh, lampooned a little bit onto this talk show to talk about this, but they were actually quite respectful. And if you want to see my five minutes of radio show fame, you can go to their website and find me talk about electronic tattoos on people's skin that may be a sci-fi reality in the near future. So we can't control what happens to our messages is the main point of that. All right, the last meaty slide I wanna give and I'll wrap it up is what should be reported. So I talked about what actually is or how people read it, but let's talk about the real scenario. So you're a researcher, you, made, you tested some devices or some new medical treatment, or you collected data on some event 
it doesn't matter what kind of scientist you are, you have data. And that data shows performance where it could be bad or it could be better. And you want it obviously to be better. And then you collected all these data points and you have some dependent variable. It doesn't matter what that is. It could be count the number of devices, you know, which device you made, or maybe something that you're turning the knob on. Okay. But either way, it's part of your experiment and these are your results. That's every last data point. The first step of triage is typically outlier removal. Anomalies. These are the kind of things that, you know, they happen. Maybe you care about humidity and you recognize that the lower data points came in on a day when the humidity was off in the lab. And so you remove them. Most of the time, this is not interpreted as unethical behavior. Next typically comes the removal of distracting data. Oh, wait a minute. What on earth is distracting? I mean, uh, granted, this plot looks a lot cleaner and easier to interpret than the other one. But what about all these other data points is deemed as distracting? Well, in most cases, it's distracting because it's not good. And it doesn't allow for the real accomplishment to stay center stage. Finally, what the media actually get a hold of and report is this data which is the only data point that gives the best performance. And that's where the dialogue hits the news stamps. That's the one that gets held by John Kelly on CNBC uh, with the talking points and the four superlatives before each of them. And that is what you learn about at the end of the day. So why, wh what happened? What, where is the ethics in this process from step to step? I'll tell you one thing. I present new grad students, new PhD students with this sort of the scenario every, every year that I train the new ones that are coming into the program. And I ask them, is the step from point two to point three unethical behavior? And you would be astonished with the differing opinions about that point. And to be honest with you, depending entirely on the scenario, I'm not entirely sure I have a fixed opinion about that. Because you see, I've come to recognize as a scientist that there are situations where me showing plot number two to someone will lead them to draw conclusions that are entirely inaccurate about the possibility of the data I'm reporting. Whereas if I were to show them the plot three, even though they don't see the whole picture of what was collected, the accuracy of the conclusions they will draw would actually be more aligned with the reality of the full experiment than otherwise. That's the type of splitting hairs that only folks deeply involved in a specific area can really do. And that's why one of the challenges to the field guide of scientific ethics is how personalized it has to be. It has to be something that's driven internally and that is reminded broadly and that is governed in the best possible ways can be imagined in an organization. Oh, I forgot to animate in that the media usually removes the dependent variable and just makes it about the one data point. Okay, so I'm not going to spend time on this one. Uh, I, I just want to point out that uh, there is a, a lot of other push in the, in the community to the fact that most major discoveries for great inventions, Nobel Prize winners, with the age that the scientist was when the discovery happened is actually something they have found a lot of confirming evidence of. Most of those discoveries happen when the scientist is in their 30s and the peak coming near the late 30s, early 40s. And if you know anything about how old I am, that means I should be doing something really amazing really soon. Otherwise, I will slide right on down this curve like most of the scientists that are actively pursuing their fields today. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because most often, young early career scientists have to spend the bulk of their time going through the hoops of making themselves known in the academic world. And you can argue and say, no, 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 you are wrong. That type of pressure drives innovation. That's what creates the curve. But there's a whole other faction of people who say, no, we are pushing the curve to older and older ages. When the acumen of scientific reasoning and creativity is waning, and giving more attention and more money into the same old codgers that are doing the same old things. And I'm becoming one of them. So this is the type of problem that is systemic 
in its need for being addressed across scientific research. All right, I talked a lot. Uh, I, I know I covered a lot of things. This slide's got a ton of arrows on it. Uh, I just animating in the four questions that I tried to address with a few perspectives for you. Ultimately, I hope that in spite of somewhat of a, I don't wanna call it a negative tone, but I know I've kind of pointed out some problems. I hope you leave being excited still and optimistic. Look, I know all this stuff and I'm still the guy that'll get sucked into the cover article of a popular science magazine. I know everything about what's going on in the background and it still thrills me. So don't allow it to compromise that, even though you know there are problems. There's still a lot of great discovery and invention that happens. Critical, it's critical that ethical decision points are improved upon along the way in our scientific path. And I threw this last point in because it's uh, frequently questioned in our day and age, but I wanna make sure people know it's worth trusting in ground truths that are scientific. They are real and they do not change. What changes is how they apply to certain things that we're still learning. And that's okay. It's okay for hypotheses to test and change and challenge reasoning. Ground truths still remain the same. And that's okay to, to believe and embrace. So in conclusion, when someone like a John Kelly of your life takes your work and brings it before the world, and regardless of whether you're a scientist or otherwise, have a little patience. Recognize the role ethically that you might be able to play in the messaging as your career plays on and be part of the solution rather than part of the ongoing confusion that often results from the reaction that we're forcing today. Thanks so much for uh, the attention. I always put this slide up. I only showed a fraction of work that happens in my lab, but these guys are awesome. And they are my PhD students and collaborators and the funding agencies that uh, support the work we do. So I'd be happy to uh, take any questions and spend as long as you'd like discussing. Thank you. Dr. Frank Franklin, what a treat. Um, my goodness, thank you so much. Uh, this is fantastic. I'm still kind of digesting, I'm sure our audience is too. And i um, grateful to see the credit to your, to your students and contributors uh, there as well. Um, some questions have come in and I, you know, just to kind of kick things off, as consumers of, I mean, you know, media in general, this is a hot topic right now, but especially consumers of, of research uh, content, it sounds like there are kind of some disconnects between the, the release of the information and, and when it gets to our, um, our devices that we're, we're reading the, uh, the headlines on. What would be your recommendation um, as we consume? What questions to ask, uh, what to consider? Thoughts on that? Great question, gosh. Uh, do I have another 50 minutes uh, for answering that one and, and everyone other? Uh, no, you know, uh, maybe the best way to answer it is to, is to tell a very brief story. And, and, and I don't mean this to be, you know, I know there's some political charging to this topic. I don't want there to be, but uh, you might remember a month or two ago when hydroxychloroquine was promoted as a treatment for COVID-19. And I, I, I have no experience medically in that space. So I had no ability to say, oh, they're right or they're wrong. And I woke up one morning and I'm talking, I do not wake up easily. And my wife could vouch for that. I mean, sleep through anything, good night, sleep. I woke up one morning in like a cold sweat of nervous energy and anxiety, which is not unlike me. And it was because I realized that even as a scientist, I was completely lost. I had no idea what, to, what conclusion to draw. Who, people felt so strongly about this topic that, that it's, it's a scientific topic that was under active research. And I felt, uh, I felt completely powerless about how to correctly draw conclusions on it. And so I spent that day, was the least productive day of my whole year in my career because I did nothing with my work. And I spent the whole day reading scientific articles, reading about whatever clinical trials had happened, trying the best I could to educate myself in my scientific brain on this topic. Like uh, the, I didn't care politically what the answer, I, I just wanted to know is, does this work or not? I mean, I just wanted the same answer that everyone else wanted. Uh, and yet I knew how to approach it a little bit more from the scientific evaluation side. So um, the net result won't impress you. I was still unsure. I mean, I spent all that time and uh, I ended up getting some good feedback from folks who were in that field, who I, I had known and had connections to. And, uh, and, you know, and I think as history evolved, uh, some more answers have sort of played out there. But, but to me, it's an, it's an example answer to that question, which is, I don't know that there's any fixed advice other than 
don't jump to, to conclusions as rapidly as the headline wants, wants to get you there. And, and that's to do with anything that has scientific bearing to it. And it doesn't mean I think you should doubt everything. It just means don't ab abandon that, that inner born rational inner th the thinker. Don't let the thinker give up. Okay, the, the people who wrote the headlines don't deserve that, nor do the people who speak so loudly and conclusively about something that's under still active exploration. Be willing to give rational thought into whatever it is be, is being claimed in a scientific find. Great, great feedback. Um, thank you. I think always the, you know, get excited, but, pr but proceed with caution and uh, doing our own, our own research a little bit. Um, thank you, great feedback. One of the questions here is, what areas of scientific research are you on your own or others most excited about right now? Wow, that's a, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll lean to what I at least showed you a few fun graphics on. I'm very excited about printed electronics in my area. Uh, so, and, and uh, there's great things happening in my research lab across lots of areas. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm playing favoritism to my PhD student children here. But uh, the, the, the fact is there is so much movement in this field of printing electronic devices, not 3D printing, but printing them onto existing surfaces uh, to do things that we cannot do with silicon. So it's not about changing what we do with computer chips or anything else. It's creating new functionality, and that gets me pretty excited. I, I we don't we don't make the sci-fi applications. We don't go that far, but but just looking at the type of materials we study and how they are able to offer unprecedented performance and capability, still all the data points don't look good, but the ones that do are really looking encouraging. So that makes me excited. And aside from that, my answer to that question is everything. I'm, I'm a scientific geek. So like I said, with the popular science magazine stuff, I'm a sucker. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty motivated by just about anything from my scientific conferences to the CES. Awesome. Thank you. We, um, a few more are coming in and, and we just want to say, we know that we're, we're coming up on the hour. So if anyone needs to take off, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and Dr. Franklin, if you're okay, we'd, we'd love to pitch you a few more questions. Is that all right? I'd love to stick around. Yeah. And I appreciate those who are willing and I certainly understand those who cannot. Thank you to those who may have to leave for uh, your generous time. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, well, we'll go ahead and, and continue on for a minute here. Uh, another question came in uh, about the peer review process. So that's uh, fraught with some issues. Any observations there? Oh, gosh, I should have had like 10 backup slides on that because uh, heaven knows I've spent the bulk of my career thinking about it. Um, so the peer review process, uh, for those who are unaware, very briefly, you submit a scientific paper to a journal. And in most every case, it is single blind review, meaning you will never know who reviewed it, but they know who you are because your authorship and affiliation are kept intact on that paper. Um, a lot of debate about whether it should be double blinded uh, or single blinded, but the the review, if the editor even decides to send it to review, those reviewers come back, the editor makes a decision about whether based on those reviews, they want to let you revise it or they want to reject it or whatnot, and the process proceeds from there. Uh, in terms of my my kind of sense of the ethics in the process, gosh, it's so messy. It's messy at every single step of that process. It's messy because editors ultimately need to publish papers that will get cited. And that doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, especially if it's science and nature, which are the most preeminent science journals across any discipline, whether you're a sociologist, a geog ge you know, geologist, or an electrical engineer. Um, and those are paid editorial staff that, uh, that have to publish papers that will get cited. And it's just a fact that big names get cited. And so you, you have to, you have constantly have to wrestle with, with the ethical nature of that decision-making process. And, and then there's the, the you know, back scratch phenomenon where you have this list of recommended reviewers that you push through and uh, the editors oftentimes will choose at least two out of the three reviewers from the list you recommend. And so if once you figure out who you should put down to give you good reviews, just statistically speaking from your experience, uh, you have a pretty heavy control of whether your papers get published and, and, and whether that's right or not, I don't know how to change it. 
And honestly, now that I'm reaching a phase in my career where I arguably am getting to a point where I maybe could be a voice for change, I admittedly am struggling with the fact that for me to change the game will affect my students that continue to have to play it. And so I can afford the career suicide that may come from you know, waving the flag and calling people out for all of the uh, mistreatment that occurs in that process of peer review. But uh, the casualties are ones that I never thought I'd have to face, which are uh, sustaining the career of my students. So I constantly have to battle the ethical nature of that process uh, while balancing the need for helping them succeed. Yeah, I, it, it sounds like it's a, a tricky process. Um, in fact, we have uh, one of the comments that came in said that uh, the research for their master's thesis was funded by the National Science Foundation. They still have context in the industry and they've learned about the unfortunate political divisions um, and even bullying. Uh, the paper titles with you know, innovative and unprecedented uh, carry these connotations that the funding source wants the general public to believe. Um, how do you manage the people who are funding research and uh, who may only be interested in controlling the opinions of the general public? Oh my goodness. So I had, a, I had a slide a few slides ago that I skipped past here that gave statistics on um, bad behavior. That's, oh, I pushed the button too many times. Here it is. And it says right here, um, changing design methodology or results of a study in response to pressure from a funding source. And 20% and of mid-career scientists said that they have done that. And, and almost 10% of early career. So, I mean, it's right on point with uh, the nature of the question that's being asked here. So uh, look, uh, how would I respond? Like, how would I manage? I love how the question was posed. Like, how would I manage that uh, side of the, the program managers and things? Um, I'll tell a very short story on that. When I was just starting my academic career at Duke uh, a little over six years ago, I needed money bad. Every new professor does. I need to woo these program managers to want to fund me. And I went and visited one of my many trips to Washington, D.C. I was sitting down with one of the program managers from one of DOD agencies' uh, funding arms. And I was giving a pitch like, hey, look at this cool idea. Hey, look at this cool idea. And this, and this person visibly yawning in front of me. I mean, just, I had lost them, okay? They're, they're so disinterested in everything I was saying. And so finally, I, I'm a little too blunt. So I stopped talking and I say, it's clear that this is not motivating you. Would you mind giving me an example of something you have recently funded that makes you particularly excited? And, and he lit right up, they, oh yes. And he proceeded to tell me all about this paper that was published, that was from work he funded, that I knew the, the, the group that did the work. The, the lab was uh, managed by a professor that's a good friend of mine, okay? So I'm very familiar with the work. And I knew that the work was one of those next new things, okay? It, it, it was that road trip analogy. And so I said to this gentleman, when he got done describing that, I said, so let me get this straight. What you're looking to, to do is put all of your funding for your program into the next shiny, new, sufficiently buzzword topic in order to get a single flashy publication that's not going to translate to any real progress on the problem we're talking about. And he looked at me stunned, you know, because people who actually want something like funding don't say those things, not good behavior. I tell my students, you know, do as I say, not as I do there. Um, but this person stunned, he looked at me, said, yeah, I guess. I said, you know what, then you're right. This is probably wasting our time because that's not the kind of work that I'm interested in doing right now. And, and that was it. And, that was, and then we had this awkward walk down the hall to my next meeting and he's like, well, good luck. Here's the cool part of the story. In, in that was like six years ago, right? In the six years since then, he continues to reach out to me every single time we're at the same conference and asks me to ask me to go to lunch. And he has since funded two different program projects that I have been a part of in that time. So I don't want to say that's a good approach still, but but I do I do laugh a little when you say, hey, how do I manage you know this type of behavior for program managers? Because look, I feel for them. They're under pressure to do these things as well. To, 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 they're going to get, get pushed into different roles if they're not able to 
get big flashy publications out of the work they sponsor. So it's a, uh, you know, we, we self-fulfill that prophecy of uh, unethical behavior in some ways. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I applaud you because it takes a level of diplomacy as well to, you know, manage that, that, that those different interests. And um, it sounds like you handled that well. <laughs> a diplomacy and gumption. And, and <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, we've got a few more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap sure. up. Um, one more uh, is, is asking about, you know, appears that scientists are, are more conservative and less progressive when it comes to science policies. Uh, what can a young scientist do in order to improve long lasting scientific policies that hurt the scientific community? Wow, what, what, a, what a powerful question. Um, so gosh, for as young scientists, I, I think most of them do the best thing as it is, which is they, they, they try to make as much noise as possible about the areas that they are passionate about and try to get the uh, funding communities excited about those topics. So uh, you're right that a lot of the guiding decision points that happen scientifically um, are driven by uh, folks who have aged out of the really progressive and, and highly innovative thinking. Uh, some people would say that's a good thing that, that balances the, the overall approach with, with that sort of conservative and, and tempered mindset. Um, you know, it'd look like the wild west of scientific study if, if we took, pulled, the, pulled the cork off of uh, the, the valve that controls scientific funding and just said, free for all, you do whatever you want. Some people think that's the way to go. And, and you'd suddenly amidst chaos would have arise findings that absolutely never would have been made. And, and I think there's some truth to that, but, but what we look like at the end of all that chaos is kind of unknown. So um, the other comment I'll make is uh, because I know a lot of wh where this question would come from is, is with respect to things like climate and environmental policies. That's a, that's a really tough one. I mean, that, it's a tough one because, um, you know, I don't even have to say a thing about where, where I fall in my opinion to note the fact that there are scientific findings to support uh, just about any argument you want to want to be in, in that particular landscape. Uh, and does that mean that we actually don't know what's going on? No, that's not what I'm saying. We actually have a pretty good picture of what's going on. It just means that there are enough ways to isolate the data to, to get you convinced excessively on one side versus the other. My experience is with most topics, not even speaking specifically on climate things, the reality is somewhere in between uh, the way you end up hearing the extremities. And so, you know, again, it kind of comes back to that willingness to be rational, be balanced, uh, and, and willing to kind of consume in portions what it is you're, you're being told about the situation. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's so true. It, it can be hard to kind of, you know, distance the, the emotion and, and, and rationalism uh, sometimes. So it's human behavior, it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, there's kind of a follow-up to that. You know, someone mentioned, firstly said excellent presentation. Um, what, lots of good chats coming in. Um, Thanks, very so kind. With that, uh, they're saying often people, you know, hear that science proves something is true, which is science um, has taken a prime role in the formation of public policy. It's become more prominent. Uh, can that really be said when science is based on scientific method, which is based on the model of disproving a hypothesis rather than proving it? Does that affect the ethics of scientific reporting or is that really a public perception issue or both? Wow, another powerful question that, that's difficult to unpack succinctly. We've got a good audience here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. So thank you for asking that, whoever did. I, I'll, let me let me maybe say say it this way in terms of the scientific method um, one thing to keep in mind is the genericized format of the scientific method this idea of hypotheses uh, being sought for you know dis disproving a hypothesis through experimentation and allowing that to feel the next step don't, don't try to, don't paint the picture quite so negatively is what one of my pieces of advice would be most hypotheses are, are driven by predicted positive behavior that we look to prove. So you could argue that uh, that's bad ethics because maybe it puts a little too much subjectivity into interpretation on results, but it's also kind of human behavior. You know, no, no one wants to do something just to tell, tell you know, pop someone's bubble. Uh, you think that's possible? I'll prove why it's not. There aren't very many good PhD dissertations that uh, have as their headline, all the reasons why this never will work. 
And while it happens, it's not, you know, it's the, it's the Einstein lab cliche. Uh, I found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb, right? You wouldn't care darn about that if they didn't find the way that did. So, you know, ultimately, I think that we need to still interpret science with, with a reasonably positive air that, that even if we are disproving hypotheses, it's to reach a goal that betters society. You know, the, the, the kind of credo of an engineer scientist is developing and inventing to the betterment of the world and society. And so the, we actually do have that sort of beached paradise that I painted in the road trip picture in mind when we set out to follow the scientific uh, process. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna act like I'm countering the, the, the question is great. And gosh, we could unpack all kinds of other elements of, of what, what was asked in there. Um, I think the one thing that kind of came to mind first in hearing it though, is just recognizing that uh, our skepticism of the scientific method should actually be lessened a little bit by virtue of the fact that these are real people with really strong and often very accurate and positive goals that are, are just trying to follow the methodology that gets them to where they're hoping to go. Thank you, Aaron. You know, I, I've had similar thoughts myself thinking someone, there's someone at the end of that, that uh, keyboard who, who has a family and friends and, and uh, ho hopefully most of them are, are trying to, to do their best. So um, good perspective, kind of dialing, dialing that back. A final question, um, you know, probably one that's uh, hot and burning on a lot of people's minds is COVID related. Um, people have been just discussing, you know, a lot of questions around vaccines. Um, so the question is how to manage exposure of trial participants uh, to the COVID virus. Have some wear masks, um, actually introduce watered down virus to participants, what groups recruited, thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, just a softball at the end. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And how bold of you to allow that one to squeeze by the filter. That's that's so great. Uh, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all, but it comes with the answer being mostly just a disclaimer, which is that I'm not a medical uh, uh, scientist, nor definitely not a medical doctor. And I have no direct expertise as it goes with infectious diseases. Um, and if anything, the only level of expertise I have, which is minimal, is in the area of immunodiagnostics, which I do some studying there, so I could comment very loosely about diagnostic tests and the efficacy and such. But aside from that, um, what I would be able to comment on in terms of the efficacy of the vac vaccine development processes or any related efficacy of masks and, and otherwise is going to be couched in the same science that's available to everyone. Uh, what I can tell you coming from a university that has a world renowned medical center and that has done, according to anyone who's done reporting on Duke, a stand up job of managing the coronavirus amidst having students come back to campus, um, is, and sorry, I should have ended that a little while ago there to so stop sharing screen, but uh, what I can tell you is that the way that Duke has gone about managing this, I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm not going to pretend to you that it's because we interpret all of the science perfectly accurately. All I'll tell you is that by implementing a mandate on our campus of mask wearing by all individuals and of social distancing, we have managed and doing tests, and we, we do 15,000 tests a week. So the philosophy of doing more tests yields a higher rate of infection. You know, there's a lot of scientific conundrums built into philosophies that are being th thrown out there. The only thing I'll tell you is 15,000 tests a week are done at Duke. And we average about 10 to 15 positive cases out of that 15,000, which is way below the infection rates that you see in most any other uh, specific isolated environments. And I think it's a decent crucible. It's not perfect. You know, people, the rate of infection, I can tell you, like 80% of those infected cases are traced back to off-campus exposures that usually have to do with being in an environment where food's being eaten. And so, uh, you know, I, again, I, I don't want to, to turn it into a preach session one way or the other, because I, I think everyone has the right to look at what scientific data is out there and, and reach conclusions. Uh, I just would encourage anyone who is still under, you know, uncertain about uh, how to approach the mask side of the situation to look at some of these more isolated scenarios. They do exist. I think Duke is one of many. And, uh, you know, consider it for what it's worth. That's a completely unpolitically charged and 
you know, not even some science that I myself have done, but as a scientist, that's what I encourage someone to think about. So in the last comment on the vaccine, all I can tell you is I was super excited by Pfizer's announcement. I hope everyone was. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's encouraging. Lots of other efforts seem to be underway. I know Duke has an effort uh, and a very well-established vaccination development institute here. They seem optimistic about what they're doing, not on the same timeline as Pfizer, but you know, let's be positive. Let's be prayerful. Let's be supportive of what we can to keep everyone as healthy as possible until we get back to something closer to normality. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, and, and I think my main takeaway is is it's all about asking questions, right? Science is asking questions and being curious. And uh, clearly, our, our audience was here today, and so we thank everyone um, for your curiosity and coming with us to discuss ethics in in research and breakthroughs. Um, powerful stuff. And uh, Dr. Franklin, thank you again. We're so grateful for your time and energy, and and uh, for everyone tuning in. And with that, we hope to see you at future Management Society events and we'll stay in touch. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. What a pleasure to be with everyone. Thank you for your time.